in many democracies, we are seeing a backlash against elites and established political parties uh, out of a sense that they have failed. O um Brasil conversa agora com o filósofo americano Michael Sandel. Ele é professor da Universidade de Harvard, onde ministra um dos cursos mais populares da instituição. É o curso Justice, pelo qual já passaram mais de 15 mil alunos. O resumo das aulas palestras deram origem ao livro Justice, que discute o que é fazer a coisa certa. Quem me ajuda neste debate é Renan Ferreirinha, que estuda economia aqui em Harvard e é cofundador do Mapa Educação. Professor, thank you very much for It's a pleasure. being here. Well, this book is a bestseller. It says here more than 100,000 sold just in Brazil. So, is society nowadays more prone to discuss ethics and democracy? I think that there is a great hunger for discussion of questions of ethics and values and justice in public life. I think this is especially true in Brazil, where in recent years there have been debates and public demonstrations about questions of corruption, but also, I think, about the future of democracy. So every time I visit Brazil, I find that audiences, and especially students and the younger generation, are hungry to engage with big questions of values and of justice. And you do that by analyzing um, daily common things yes. in daily life. That's why people uh, recognize and can understand it very, very clear. But you don't need to understand philosophy, like to be a specialist right. to read this book, right? Right. The idea was to write this book, though it's a book about political philosophy and ethics, My goal was to write it in a way that would make it accessible to uh, ordinary citizens who were not scholars, who had not studied philosophy before. And the way I try to do that is to offer very concrete, everyday examples of ethical dilemmas that we all face in our everyday lives as a way of inviting people to think about values and the larger philosophical questions that those dilemmas present to us. Ferreirinha, as a Harvard student, how do you see that? Yeah, so it's first a great pleasure to be here and to have Professor Sandel talking about like justice, citizenship, and the Brazilian scenario as well, right? What we saw like uh, most recently, it's very important for us to have an open debate about these important themes. And so when I was like considering applying to study in an American school, like I heard about a famous professor who was able to like lead big discussions and like make students excited about studying philosophy. And we all know like how philosophy is taught in high school in Brazil. And that was not the experience that I had in high school. I was like, I was curious to know like uh, how that present in college. So professor, that was one of the main reasons I applied to Harvard and that got to know about this liberal arts education that we have here in the United States and so on. And I had the pleasure to have class with him three times. One was like online version of Justice, and the other two like uh, in person here at Harvard in the past four years. And more recently, to go to Brazil with him uh, for two trips. So tell me about the, that experience in Brazil that you, you did together. Yeah, so when I was taking the last class, it was like a very, very interesting experience because there was a small seminar. So we were like 14, 13 students. So it was like a very close relationship, right? And by the end of the semester, I told Professor Sandel that I would like to, to have him in Brazil and talking about ethics, citizenship, justice in general. And he told me he had come there already three times uh, and he would only accept that offer, if it, that proposal, if that was like uh, to speak to the mass, okay. like to speak like to Brazilians from like different socioeconomic classes and so on and we could go beyond like just the lead to like some debates they're sometimes very centralized right and and a few months after that we were having like a lot of discussions pre impeachment in brazil and there was one day that just like the judge moro released like some auto message from former president lula and it was like a very very sad day for me because like the country was split i'm not talking about if that was right or wrong but half of the country is saying like this is really good because now we know the truth and so on And the other half was like, you know, how can you treat a former president like that? And based on the fact 
the Brazilian society couldn't decide what was wrong and what was right. And I could only, I could only think about him to lead this type of discussion, right? And, and then like, uh, I invited him to go to Brazil and also like, we got in touch with the producers of Caldeirão do Hulk. Mm -hmm. And that ended up happening like, in early May, where he came to lead a discussion about Jeitinho Brasileiro and ethics, like uh, alive. We had like more than 25 million watching that like program. That was like the peak of audience like in TV Global on Saturdays. And for 2016, it was very exciting. And he also had a chance to visit like a complex to Okay. It's like the biggest favela in Rio. And ended up coming back like in December to speak at the Supreme Court by the invitation of Ministro Luiz Roberto Barroso. Okay, so you were at a mass program show in Brazil, then you went to the kind of favela, yes, a complex. Sure. Now it's, uh, it's getting better. I mean, there's still a lot to do. Yes, <laughs> okay. And then you also went to the Supreme Court. So yes. you saw the different, different facets of the country. Yeah. What was your impression? Well, the, the opportunity to reach so many people in Brazil with the television show, the Calderon show with Luciano, um, that was a special opportunity to connect these philosophical themes with everyday life. So that, that we, we had a group of people from all social and economic backgrounds gathered in the studio. And we debated some examples from everyday life of Jay Chino. And, and we debated the question, is there a connection between ethical questions in everyday life and big questions in business and in politics and the challenge of corruption. So that was what we debated. I did not come as an expert. I came as an interested, sympathetic visitor, really just asking questions and probing. And I was deeply impressed by the discussion we had within the studio because these were people who, some ranging from professors and lawyers to people who clean the streets and who cook in people's homes. And together we had a serious discussion about big ethical questions and democracy in Brazil. So that was for me uh, uh, a special privilege really. And then also to go during the same visit to the favela and to meet with community leaders there, many young people. Mm -hmm. And we talked about citizenship and democracy and justice and injustice and violence. And they were very eloquent and passionate, yeah. weren't they? And articulate about how they conceive citizen action. What can they do to make the world a better place and to deal with the problem of violence in their communities and their relation between, the relation between their community and the national government. So that in its way was moving, impressive, exhilarating even. And then the chance to speak in the Supreme Court to a very different kind of audience, but the judiciary has been, I think, a great hero in recent developments, uh, asserting its independence and asserting the, the values of the rule of law and of democracy. So I, I feel um, really that uh, less like a teacher than like a student really learning from my encounters with uh, these very different um, parts of Brazilian society and politics. The whole concept of justice must be discussed from different fields. In, in your book, we, we see a lot of perspectives. But can we establish a kind of common ground on this matter for everyone? Well, I think the common ground, people disagree on politics. People disagree on values. But what I think can be the common ground is public deliberation where all citizens have an opportunity to make their arguments, to defend their views about what should happen in politics and in their communities, what should happen with the economy. And this is not a problem unique to Brazil. Democracies around the world today are struggling with the question of how to give citizens a meaningful voice. And many, in many democracies, we are seeing a backlash against elites and established political parties uh, out of a sense that they have failed really to offer 
meaningful alternatives in politics. We saw that in the recent American election. We're seeing that throughout Europe, where citizens are frustrated with politics. They don't think democracy is working well, and they are seeking ways to have a better kind of public discourse that really addresses big questions. So Brazil is having its own struggles and challenges, but I think it's important to recognize that people are struggling to give citizens a meaningful voice in democracies around the world, and I, I would not say that we've offered a very shining example of how best to do that. Yeah, so as Professor Nell was saying, like, there's a lot of things that happen like that, just in, like in a global level, right? And like this, this, hung, this hunger for like a better, more democratic like, system is like, uh, it's not just in Brazil, it's not just in the US. We see that like in West Europe, we see that like in many developing countries in, at all. But we can learn from like many different experiences and try, kind of draw a parallel, right? And talk about Brazil and the US more specifically, which were the ones that I, I know better because of like the past years. Like Brazil is a very recent democracy. Yeah. We're like very late 30s, right? So there's still like, a, we could call ourselves like millennials, right? So like if you think about it, and, and then pose like some risks for our institutions. We still have like to develop and strengthen our institutions like in a way that we can impede some things to happen. And I do think we have been striving in many things. We have like an independent judiciary. We have like a, a good, a very good electoral system, probably one of the best in the world, definitely better than the one in the US if, if you think about like some things that can happen. But like we also have to strive and strengthen many other things. And when we talk about the U.S., like the, these guys have been here like since like 1776, and like in, with a constitution like a few years later after that that hasn't changed. If you think about the original version, they have been added different things. So like the the U.S. is like a more mature democracy, right? And and if you think about this more mature democracy, you can still have some things happen like as like happened like last like last, uh, last year, right? That surprised like many people, but a lot of people were not surprised. And that, that makes me think about like how we can like uh, move beyond that. And like there's no better way for me than like establishing more dialogues, right? Establishing more better channels of communication and like make sure we can understand and discuss our themes, right? We, I don't have the answer. Uh, Professor Sandel doesn't have the answer for all the questions. Like he does have for many questions, but like, uh, I feel like we should engage in a conversation like this. So what I feel like that we miss a lot in Brazil and what my college experience in the US has allowed me to do, and I'll not say like that's, that happens in the whole United States, but it does happen like at least at Harvard, is that we do talk about the issues. Like we do raise some issues and like discuss that and how we can like get better about like kind of modeling our minds is just about like make sure we are talking about it. Okay, the best part of democracy is that we have the right to express our opinions and people are expressing a lot. And you never judge people or situations in this book. Wasn't that, I know, I understand that as a philosopher you just raised the questions, but wasn't that hard not uh, give opinions or to remain impartial before so many dilemmas? Well, it is true that the, that the book does not tell people how to think or what to think. It, um, invites and provokes people to reflect on some of the big questions we face as citizens. And it does so by asking questions and posing uh, dilemmas that we confront in public and in private life. Uh, in a way, that way of doing philosophy came naturally because it grew out of the way I've always taught. Um, even with a large group of students in an auditorium, I've always, I've not just lectured at them, but I've put questions to them, even during the lecture, and invited them to give their views and then to respond to one another and to disagree with what I've said. And then to connect their views to what the great philosophers of the past have written. So that's the way I've always taught. And if you think about it, Going back to the origin of philosophy with Socrates, Socrates never lectured. He didn't even write a book. Yes. He wandered the streets of Athens and engaged people, ordinary people, in discussion and dialogue about their assumptions and about their values and about what they thought justice meant. And I admire his example. Some people 
believe that philosophy resides in the clouds, far above the world in which we live. But I think philosophy belongs in the city where citizens gather and discuss and debate how to shape their lives together. And, and so that's the way I think philosophy can best contribute to democracy and to deliberation about the common good. If you want to explore the matter, we need to understand the meaning of justice, which can be taught from different perspectives. And you do that by analyzing three ideas, welfare, freedom, and virtue. Yes. Could you talk about those three, please? Well, the idea of welfare, there are some people who think that justice is simply a matter of adding up people's preferences, people's interests. This is the utilitarian idea. Justice means the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. And that seems very attractive until you think that sometimes that might involve violating people's rights. Think back to the example of the, uh, the Romans in the ancient Colosseum who threw Christians to the lions for sport. Now, if there are enough cheering Romans in the Colosseum who are deriving pleasure from this gruesome spectacle, the utilitarian philosophy might have to say, well, then that's just. But what about the rights and the human dignity of the minority whose rights are being violated? So that suggests the second idea of justice, that justice means respecting human dignity, individual rights, and the freedom of people to decide for themselves what kind of lives they'd like to live. And then we explore in the book that theory and ask, is it possible to define people's rights, what it means to respect persons, without having some conception of, of what the good life consists in? And that leads to the third idea, which is that justice has to do with, with virtue and the good life. And that, in the end, is the view that I think is a necessary element of any adequate account of justice, because uh, I don't think it's possible, in the end, to define the common good or individual rights without asking the question, what is the good life? What does it mean to live together to develop good character, and to care for the common good. So that's, I hope, not giving away too much for people who haven't read the book. So I do have a view at the end, but it emerges gently, not didactically, not by preaching, but by exploring these different ways of thinking about justice. Jania, anything to add? Yeah, I'm just going to add, like, uh, from the previous question, when you ask him about like uh, what he thinks, right? Like when you read the books and like different things, and I actually asked him this question to him like uh, last year, actually two years ago when I finished in the last class, and I was professor. I have read like your books. I have attended your classes, and sometimes I just want to know what, what you really think about like what's what should be right and wrong, and he said something to me that was like uh, very special that I try to apply in different things in my life that you don't need to say or just state what you think every single time, or sometimes even like uh, any time. You might just need to ask the right questions, right? So asking the right questions and engaging that discussion is something like that he does very well, his books right, pass this message very well, and hopefully we as a society could do that much better. Well, justice and rights, obligation and consensus, honor and virtue, moral and law, they are quite old ideas, but still a challenge for us, aren't they? Well, they are, and sometimes we wrestle with these big questions and wonder if those famous philosophers for 2,000 years weren't able to come up with a single definitive answer, how can we hope to do so? Doesn't philosophy seem impossible? Uh, to which the answer, I think, is it sometimes seems impossible, but it's also unavoidable because we live some answer to these questions every day. Uh, every time we make choices, whether in our personal lives or in democratic life, we are affirming one or another conception of rights, democracy, the best way to live. And so my project is to encourage citizens in democratic societies 
to engage with a morally more robust kind of public discourse than the kind to which we've become accustomed. Not because we'll all agree, but because I think that will make us better democratic citizens. And I think in the end, it will strengthen democracy. To finish uh, some piece of advice for Brazilians to get through this crisis we, we are living now. Right, uh, well, I would say that one of the great strengths of Brazil is a spirit of resourcefulness and energy and passion. And I see a lot of that passion today directed toward uh, deepening the democracy. The young democracy, as Hanon pointed out. It is a young democracy. Um, but I think it's important to look around the world to notice the wrong turns that some democratic societies have taken in the direction of uh, extremist uh, solutions born of anger and resentment. And to try to guard against that in Brazil, to try to create um, a, a strong enough kind of public debate among citizens so that Brazil will not fall victim to the extremist angry solutions that we see uh, cropping up in some other democratic societies around the world. And, um, and I, very much, I very much hope, and I also believe, that Brazil will be able to succeed in that challenge. I think you do too. I mean, of course, I, I agree with 100% of Professor Andel said. I'm, uh, I'm not optimistic. I'm very realistic about the Brazilian situation. And like my, my realism is very like that we will succeed. I feel like there are a lot of things that are happening like that we are going in that direction. Sometimes we wish that would be faster. And like I share the feeling sometimes like well, we're missing that opportunity again. We're the country of the future and so on. But I do think we're in the right track. And if I could just add, I yes. think the success of, of Brazil's democratic future will depend especially on the younger generation, including young leaders like Henan, who care about the future of democracy, who take pride in the achievement of Brazil in relatively few decades, and who are committed to deepening this great democratic experiment. Ferreirinha, thank you very much for thank helping us. Professor, thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking thank you. to you. My pleasure. <laughs>